Alright, great. Thank you, everybody. Um, sorry, I just can't hear about you in the conference. But, so, um, my presentation is going to be a little bit different than yours. Uh, uh, the publication in... Is everybody here? Alright, great. Um, so the history of capital in Poland is really uh, also the history of Poland and the reception and the dissemination of capital in Poland is deeply bound up with uh, some very dramatic events in late 19th century um, and 20th century Polish history. So I want to tell a little bit of that story today, um, but my view is that uh, we should start from the end. I think telling the story this way takes us a lot to uh, take uh, the current predicament as a puzzle and help us figure out how we got to a situation like this. So, um, over here, uh, this is an ad campaign for a very popular uh, Polish clothing label called Red is Bad. And uh, you can see here, it's a little bit silly, but it is quite popular um, and very emblematic, I think, of uh, the sense of how people think about Marx today in Poland. Uh, they're grinding up editions of some books by Marx. Um, and when I was researching uh, for, for the book chapter that I wrote, I was trying to get a sense of how people thought about capital today in Poland, and I found when I just did a Google News result, uh, just calling somebody a Marxist was a slur. Um, now, Marx is seen as emblematic of the atrocities of the authoritarianism of the 20th century, um, but we can see that the history of the reception of capital in Poland, at least until the Second World War, um, has a really anti-authoritarian bent and stresses intellectual openness and methodological pluralism that I think is quite different than uh, maybe sort of providential views of history um, that were associated with the reception of Marx elsewhere in Europe at the time. Um, also, I just wanted to mention that uh, presently in Poland there's a crypto-fascist party governing um, and there's no leftist party in parliament. Uh, and what's interesting is that the party in power scapegoats communists, even though there are no communists left. Um, so, how does this happen? Uh, I guess we can start at the beginning here. So, over here is a map of the partitions of Poland. Uh, these are the political boundaries that would have been the same at the time of the appearance of the first translation of capital as it was being prepared in 1883. Uh, during this period, the Prussian, Russian, and Austro-Hungarian empires exercised strict censorship over the occupied territories and really cracked down on both socialist and nationalist movements. Um, here in the bottom green area is Galicia, um, which was an autonomous province of the Austro-Hungarian Empire uh, as of the 1870s and was a real hotbed of socialist activity. Uh, Krakow was there as well. Um, but the censorship there was uh, just as strict as in the other occupied territories. So the first translation of Capital in Polish began here in Krakow in 1882 uh, by a gentleman by the name of uh, E. Kulbachowski, though he disappears from the historical records after police raided his house, and uh, as happens in Poland, uh, we just don't know about him or uh, what came of his translation. Um, so during the late 19th century, young Poles were traveling to study in the large cities of the Russian Empire particularly in Petersburg, Kiev, and Odessa, where they became acquainted with the work of Marx and clandestinely brought copies of his work home with them. Uh, domestically, Marx's work was popularized by Ludwig Varinsky's Proletariat Party, as well as through the work of Szymon Dzikszta, who also translated Darwin for the first time into Polish, uh, and he published an immensely popular pamphlet titled Who Earns His Living and How, which really introduced the Polish people to the idea of surplus value. Uh, Polish libraries had copies of the German, Russian, and French editions of Capital well before the first Polish translation in 1883, so we can date the earliest extant edition um, in a Polish library to 1872, which was acquired by the Ossolonian Library, um, and that was the second German edition. Um, so, there we go, okay. So the first translation of uh, Capital Volume 1 that did make its publication was initiated by uh, Stanisław Kruszynski, uh, there on the very left. Uh, he ultimately translated a third of the text, uh, but he also helped finance the translation by holding secret paid lectures. Uh, also in the middle there is uh, Wieczysław Kruszynski, who is largely known in Poland for helping create 
Polish Educational Society, uh, which was a secret cultural institution tasked with the education of Polish culture and language under occupation. Um, and finally on the right is a notable figure, uh, Ludwig Przybyski, uh, who is uh, an incredibly eminent sociologist, uh, probably the most famous Polish sociologist, and was really instrumental in popularizing capital uh, in that field. Uh, also working on the translation where these two fellows Kazimierz Plawinski and Josef Szymaszko, uh, but uh, just no photographs exist for them. Uh, all of these translators were really involved in the Polish socialist movement uh, and really suffered under the hands of police. Uh, Plawinski was one of the first Polish socialists working with uh, Ludwig Wierzyński, who I mentioned, uh, but he was unable to finish his medical studies at Warsaw because of his political involvement uh, and in 1879 uh, he was thrown into jail for helping rev Russian revolutionaries across the border. Uh, Krzywitsky was likewise expelled from the Faculty of Medicine at Warsaw University uh, for his political involvement, and Brzezinski had received a three-year prison term uh, and was prohibited from teaching because he was politically unreliable, which, uh, as we'll see, is a recurring trend in the history of Polish uh, socialism. Um, so, I'll give you a sense of how this was received after its first publication. So here we have a slide. These are the most cited works by Polish sociologists until 1939. Uh, the number of citations is pretty low as sociology is still a developing discipline at the time, especially in Poland. Uh, but you can see that Capital One uh, becomes incredibly popular in Polish sociology almost immediately after it gets published. Uh, in this table. I should also say something about Krzywitsky's work here, who appears in the fourth column. Um, he's also quite important in the development of Polish sociology and actually overtakes Marx and citations in the 20s. Among his most important contributions in the reception of capital was his firm rejection of economic determinism. Krzywitsky claimed that capital describes capital's tendencies as ideal types that did not and never would come into existence. The arguments in capital were therefore revisable in light of new evidence. Krzywitsky had further firmly rejected a unilinear account of economic development popularized uh, by Engels, uh, having had emphasized uh, something of a multilinear concept of development, where different societies pass through different developmental stages and uh, where, moreover, societies at the same stage of development form quite different socio-political systems. Uh, this is spelled out in the work you'll see in the furthest right column, uh, at the second from the top, uh, which has the unfortunate title of Socio-Economic Regimes in the Wild and in Barbarism. Uh, Krzywetsky's syncretism was widely shared by the Polish Marxists of the late 19th and early 20th century. Uh, there was another guy by the name of Kazimierz Kalis Kraus, who was the first to use the term open Marxism in Poland, suggesting that Marx's ideas were really uh, open to uh, revision after better evidence was found. Uh, looking forward a little bit, we'll see that this openness is something of a short-lived phenomenon in Poland. Uh, here, so during the 20s, work begins on a second translation of volume one, uh, and there is serious persecution of communists under the so-called Senation regime of Josef Piłsudski, uh, that handsome gentleman. Um, in point of fact, two of the three translators of the second edition of Capital Volume 1, Henrik Lauer on the left, and Jerzy Herring there in the center, uh, had worked on their translation while serving prison sentences. Uh, Mieczysław Kwiatkowski, uh, who also doesn't exist in Google Image Search, uh, was the third translation the translator, and he had served a prison term in 1920. Uh, so, no, I think I overtimed it. So uh, World War II uh, is really the beginning of the end in terms of the reception of capital. Uh, and you can really make a sense of this decline unless you understand that the intelligentsia, uh, those who would otherwise be potential scholars of Marx and Marxism, were absolutely decimated during the war as well as during Stalin's purges. Over on the right here are some uh, figures which should give you a sense of why there's no real scholarly contributions on capital in the immediate post-war period. Uh, in fact, only one professional academic uh, had survived the, pole, uh, the purges, uh, and that was Adam Schaff, who we'll return to in a second. 
So on the right here is uh, a photograph characteristic of the socialist realist style uh, that you find in Poland after the 50s, uh, and I think is an evocative visual metaphor for how Marx is received, especially capital, uh, in the 50s. Um, that is to say, the state decides. Um, as you can guess, given what we had learned in the previous slide, the systemic destruction of the intelligentsia really made the quality of scholarship in the 40s and 50s quite poor. And on top of this, academics interested in Marx were really only mouthpieces of the state. In 1948, Marxism-Leninism became the state's official doctrine, and several chairs in Marxist-Leninist philosophy were instated in Polish universities. Uh, Self-styled Marxist-Leninist theoreticians, mostly poets and literary critics at first, uh, initially popularized their views outside of the academy, but towards the end of the 50s, increasingly dominated university faculties. This support was coupled with censorship only in 1955, where philosophy journals allowed to publish non-Marxian works. Um, I should also qualify by what I mean by non-Marxian work. Ugh. Wow, I really mistimed it. Okay, so uh, to give you a one-minute overview of what is still ten minutes of presentation, uh, the state decides who gets to read uh, what in Marx. Young people are very terrified of publishing on Marx. And after 1968, uh, this is an evocative image of uh, Richard Chavez uh, immolating himself uh, in protest of the state. Uh, nobody takes capital seriously, uh, neither the state, which doesn't need ideology to justify its repression, nor academics who are no longer fought by, by the state. Uh, and I guess that's it. <laughs>